Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you, Mike Cortez, Erwin Stewart, Ken Hayes, and everybody welcome our brand new patron, Josh. Welcome, welcome Josh. Josh. <laughs> On this episode of DTNS, Google will not get rid of third-party trackers, but you still can. Why Amazon is losing money on your Echo. And Kate Lawrence joins us to talk about tech startups trying to keep your pets healthier. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, July 23rd, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Joining us, Berlin-based journalist focusing on emerging and deep tech, and today on Pet Tech, Kate Lawrence, welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Happy hey, <laughs> Good to have you. I was going to say Tuesday. No, it's the it Tuesday. It is yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday. It is. I had yeah. to look too. <laughs> it's one of those <laughs> kinds of weeks, uh, especially with the crowd strike bug uh, causing mm -hmm. havoc everywhere. Uh, there's more speculation about what caused it. We haven't heard anything substantial from crowd strike. Uh, I do cover some of the speculation in my Substack newsletter. You can get that at freetechnewsletter.com. When there's more solid info, we'll have it right here on Daily Tech News Show. So let's start with the rest of the quick hits. Google will not acquire security company Wiz after all. Sources told CNBC that the company was concerned about antitrust investigations and other investment issues. Wiz code founder Asaf Rappaport wrote in a memo to employees that the company will instead focus on an IPO and reaching $1 billion in annual recurring revenue. The company made $350 million last year, so <laughs> there's room to grow. Wiz's products can flag security issues for applications and data in cloud services like AWS, Microsoft Azure, Oracle, and Google. It's not in competition with CrowdStrike, in case you were wondering. That definitely went through my head first of like, oh, are they backing off because they see an opportunity? But apparently not. Uh, Meta released Llama 3.1, its newest and most capable model that is open for anyone to use, unless you're a company with hundreds of millions of users, in which case you have to license it. Uh, Llama 3.1 has 405 billion parameters, and Meta says that it can outperform op OpenAI's GPT-4.0 and Anthropic Claude 3.5 Sonnet. It will start powering Meta's chatbots starting in WhatsApp this week and then later in Instagram and Facebook, though you will have to select it manually. It won't be the default option, and you have a limited number of queries you can use it for per week. There's also a new feature called Imagine Me that lets you scan your own photo and place yourself in a generated image. Adobe rolled out some new generative features for Illustrator and Photoshop. In Illustrator, Generative Shape Fill lets you describe in text how to add detailed vectors to shapes. It also improves text to pattern for making things like a wallpaper that's very specific behind a subject. Photoshop gets a Generate Image feature powered by Firefly Image 3, so you can create an image with text anywhere you want. Generative Fill also gets greater sharpness and detail in the Enhanced Detail feature, and the Selection Brush tool is more generally available for separating objects from the canvas. Scientists from Google, MIT, Harvard, and the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts uh, published an article in the journal Nature Monday about a model called Neural GCM. Uh, this generative model is more accurate than models that are only based on machine learning. This combines a few different things, uh, and it's better than machine learning-based models on one to 10-day forecasts specifically. It's also better on a few other things. It can combine machine learning with neural networks and is trained on past weather data. It incorporates physics equations that model global circulation and therefore can also project climate conditions across decades, so in the future. The model is open source and efficient. It can run on a laptop. So you don't need to have hours and hours of time on a supercomputer, and it will actually, according to them, outperform those models that need hours and hours on a supercomputer. Spotify has picked up some steam, beating analyst estimates for its latest quarter, with revenue up 20%, cost down 16%, and subscribers up 14% on the year to 626 million monthly active users. 246 million of those are paid premium subscribers now and brought in 88% of its revenues. Spotify raised prices in June and brought down costs by reducing its marketing spend, and it also laid off around 1,800 workers at the end of last year, 2023. 
All right, let's get to the uh, the biggest news of the day. Google will not, after all, de deprecate third-party cookies in the Google Chrome browser uh, the way Safari and Firefox have. Uh, if you don't know what a third-party cookie is or you're a little unclear on the concept, uh, those are cookies set in your browser not by the site you're visiting. So if you're visiting Facebook.com, uh, maybe Google is sending a cookie. Probably unlikely, bad example, but you get the idea. Uh, the reason a third party would want to set cookies on sites that aren't its own is so they can collect information about you from multiple sites, gather some information and say, oh, Tom, you like dogs, we noticed. Uh, we can now target you with dog ads. Google was going to get rid of third-party cookies, just like Firefox and Safari, and instead use something called the Privacy Sandbox. This was supposed to replace third-party cookies so that you weren't directly tracked. It would keep information about your browsing habits anonymized in Chrome, and then Chrome would only communicate that data to say whether an ad should run or not, but it wouldn't share any of that data with the third parties. Now, there's a lot of good work done on whether they could actually start to learn something about you based on what ads are allowed to be served or not, but it wasn't as direct of a tracking as a third party cookie, but it also wasn't as privacy protecting as Safari and Firefox, which just said, no, you can't track them at all. Uh, so Google is not going to get rid of third party cookies after all, but it will introduce what it calls a new experience in Chrome. And we had to go to the UK Competition and Markets Authority to get a more detailed description. The CMA says it has been talking to Google and that Google will use a user choice prompt which will allow users to choose whether to retain third-party cookies or not. It's actually similar to what Apple does. It'll pop up a thing saying, hey, this, these folks would like to share your data. You could cool with that or not. Most people say no. Uh, so with Google, if you say no, they'll do the privacy sandbox. They are going to keep privacy sandbox around as an alternative. If you as a user say, no, don't let them use third-party cookies, Chrome will block the third-party cookies and use privacy sandbox. Instead, uh, along with this announcement, Google released a lot of data trying to show how effective privacy sandbox is in tests because really what they're trying to do is get advertisers to sign on to privacy sandbox, but advertisers aren't buying it. They think the third-party cookies are better. Uh, so this is a way to stop the advertisers from causing havoc with Google, especially because their main business is selling advertising, uh, but maybe coaxing them into using the privacy sandbox instead, while also trying to mollify all the regulators around the world uh, who don't want the Chrome browser to be sharing information with third parties. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kate, uh, how excited are you that, that Google is doing this instead of just getting rid of third party cookies? It's an interesting move from Google, I think. And um, I'll be interested to see how it matches up to the privacy demands of something like GDPR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's also the the, uh, the requirement that you notify people for cookies from websites mm, uh, on exactly. top of that. Uh, and you have to have informed consent. So Google is having to do a lot of work with the EU and, and the UK CMA about oh. that. Uh, Sarah, does this make much difference to your usage of Chrome? Um, not really, especially because this has been going on for years uh, with Google saying, you know, we're going to delay that whole third party cookie thing going away just to make sure we get it totally right. Ah, we're going to do that again. Ah, we're going to we're just we just want to make sure it's just perfect before we do something that other browsers already did a long time ago. Uh, Privacy Sandbox already existed. So the whole new experience in Chrome, I don't really understand. Google's like, OK, we're just going to. Use the privacy sandbox that either as a consumer, I mean, maybe it's fine with you as a consumer, but if it isn't, it's like, okay, well, it's not good enough because third-party cookies are sort of there still. And if you're an advertiser, you're like, oh, well, now I just have to use the privacy sandbox whether I want to or not, which, like you said, Tom, you can find out a fair amount of somebody, especially over time, by their habits, even if it's somewhat anonymized, but it's not what advertisers want. They want more specific data about, you know, where I am and when I'm there and, and, and why. So I, I don't know. I, I mean, I can see, I could see a lot of consumers that aren't, you know, as technically minded as all of our listeners are just kind of being like, I don't, I see ads on the internet. I mean, what's the difference? Is it really going to change my experience? Probably not. Probably not that much. Uh, for those of you who say this is, totally not good enough. And maybe Google just never meant to 
do away with third-party cookies this entire time. I mean, I'm sure the company has thought of lots of different scenarios, and this was just the middle ground that made the most sense for the company because Google is a different company than Apple or Mozilla. <laughs> Google wants to make money from ads. So I, I'm not surprised by this. I'm not particularly bent out of shape because, because I'm not surprised by it. Yeah, I, I think uh, the thing to remember is that Google uh, has pressures to make money, uh, which Firefox does too. Uh, Apple does too. They just yeah. decide to make their money in a different way. Uh, Google has the pressure of the advertisers who don't want them to get rid of third-party cookies in a much bigger way than Firefox and Apple does, right? Uh, it's a much bigger part of their business. But they also have the pressure of their audience. Uh, the audience wants privacy protections and is very loud and, and, uh, and talking about it. So they're trying to satisfy both of those masters, right? By saying, all right, we'll do privacy sandbox, but we won't force the advertiser, but we are going to ask people and most of them are going to say no. So you're going to want to move on a privacy sandbox anyway. And by the way, look at these numbers. It's 97% as effective as third-party trackers. Uh, it's, it's just a decision by committee. Uh, and, uh, I think what it's going to end up doing, I don't know, you two tell me uh, what you think, but I think it's just going to annoy people because you're suddenly going to get a bunch of pop-ups asking you if you want to allow third-party trackers or not. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. And we already have those in Europe. Um, yeah, right. We have the, those in California too. Yeah. There's actually widgets now you can install plugins to stop them because the, they're constant every time you, you're researching. You know. Yeah, the uh, Cookie-O-Matic uh, yeah, is the it. one I use for, <laughs> that's for what I the use. extension. Yeah. I, need, uh, yeah. I need that. Uh, I, I used life. to be very yeah. thoughtful, like, okay, which ones are okay? You know, the essentials, marketing, no. <laughs> and now I'm just like, yes, yes, yes. I want to read the article. Let's so, do sure. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> GPEG84 uh, says, I try not to block ads because behind every ad is someone trying to earn a living through a company they're making the ad for. I, I think that's that's an admirable sentiment. I think it's probably a minority valid. sentiment, but it's interesting. Yeah. Well, since Amazon's Echo launched way back in 2014, been around 10 years, can you believe that? More than 500 million voice-enabled hardware devices have been sold, either from Amazon's own Echo line or a compatible one, like Sonos One speakers. I've got two of them at, at my house. So it might be a little confusing that the Wall Street Journal's sources say Amazon has lost tens of billions of dollars on its devices business, the entire devices business, between 2017 and 2021. So that's the data that we're looking at. Amazon is said to be launching a paid tier for its assistant. Uh, you know what her name is. Any day now, internally codenamed Banyan and rumored to offer a smarter and more robust product called Remarkable you know who her name is, we'll call her A, which may bring some revenue up. Certainly some people are gonna buy it, but kind of a hard sell for people like me who don't buy Amazon products through my smart speakers that are uh, Amazon Assistant enabled. Uh, it, it, at the Wall Street Journal made a good analogy to Gillette razor blades. Basically, Gillette sells the blades below cost. It's a money loser. But then you rack up the bucks over time on refill blades, which as everyone who buys refill blades know, are kind of expensive. And the problem with Echo, you might say, okay, so if Amazon's selling an Echo at or below cost, uh, you know, you know how, do they, how do they make money otherwise? Well, what Amazon wanted in a you know, perfect Amazon you know, utopian uh, world uh, 10 years after the launch of this is, we're just buying stuff on Amazon through our speakers. And sometimes people do that, but more often than that, we're setting alarms, we're checking weather, maybe you got your news briefings in the morning, I'm playing music, you know, I, I already pay for Apple Music, so I'm not buying anything on Amazon for that. There's an occasional question, you know, a trivia question, or where you add something to your shopping list, and maybe that shopping list is not even something that you end up buying through Amazon. It doesn't create purchases. Uh, Kate, I was wondering uh, if you've got an mm. Echo device or anything similar and, mm. and what you think about uh, Amazon's conundrum. Yeah, I do. I have an um, Amazon Echo myself. I mean, it's such a legacy product. Like you said, it's been, what, 10 years? And it was when it came in, it was that era before a lot of the apps were around where it was, you know, it promised this kind of functionality of, you know, being a, a way to, to consume products and to buy and to communicate, you know, perhaps echo to echo, things like that. And I, I'd say all of it's been superseded by the phone, mobile phones. 
And my other thought is I would really question about who's the next generation of buyers. Is it, are we talking about millennials? Are we talking about Gen Alpha? I can't see them buying it, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I look at this and I, and I think every time I ask it a question, I'm losing Amazon money. They sold this thing to ooh. me before below cost. I don't ever buy anything with it. I am exactly. annoyed by the fact that it's trying to continually upsell me on things, uh, which I understand why, because they're trying to make money off of it. Uh, I'd almost rather pay a subscription fee if it was small and reasonable to make it work better so that it was smarter mm. and could just, you know, answer my questions better. Because there, how many times have I asked it something? And it, we asked it, uh, what's the weather in Inglewood, uh, meaning Inglewood, California? It knows we're in California. Uh, and it said, here's the weather for Inglewood, New Jersey, uh, the other day. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's worth a dollar ninety nine a month to make it answer correctly, I think. Yeah, the price will be important. Um, I don't I don't know. I, I, like you said, it could be this could be a wonderful product that's priced reasonably. And, um, you know, it's less than, you know, what I pay for my Google Cloud storage every month type thing. I just and I use my. I use Amazon's assistant for all sorts of routines on a daily basis. You know, I've got smart lights. I do, you know, I've got, uh, you know, my, my morning routine where I say good morning and then all this stuff happens, you know, in succession. I get my news briefing. I get my weather. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I do have an echo show in the kitchen and very occasionally something because I've got sort of a slideshow going at all times, you know, or, or it'll suggest something to me that it knows, you know, a certain gummy vitamin that, you know, it, it thinks maybe I'm out of. Occasionally that will spur a purchase from me, but not very often, not very often. It's, it's a device that is sort of a smart device in my home that does not compel me to buy anything. If I'm going to buy something, I reach for my laptop. Yeah. Although yeah. I guess if it reminds you, and even if you reach for your laptop, that is a purchase That's you made because because of That's the echo. True. The problem is how do you account for that? This Wall Street Journal article has a whole section on downstream accounting and how they weren't doing it right uh, because you know one purchase on Amazon could be claimed by the Fire TV device that showed you an ad and the Echo and and anything else from Amazon you had, and so sections of the company were all counting the same revenue multiple times, uh, which yeah. meant they looked more profitable on paper than they were. Well, and you compare to something like a Kindle, right? So like of oh, the yeah, hardware well. division, Kindle's in there. Kindles do well for Amazon because yeah. you buy a Kindle and then you buy eBooks. There's sort of no reason to have a Kindle otherwise, unless you're kind of doing some sort of, you know, backdoor hacky stuff. So Amazon, that works. So the Kindle group and the services group both say, yay, let's split the cost. And we both look really good on paper. Yeah, because when you have a Kindle, it makes sense to buy a book for the Kindle because you're going to read it on the Kindle. Yeah. When you have an Echo, it doesn't make sense to buy the razor blades from the Echo. You're not going to use the razor blades on the Echo. Mm -hmm. And you kind of want to make sure you're getting the right ones, too. I think that's why I always end up going to the app or the laptop or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Particularly those kind of products where it's, there's a visual element. Yeah. And I think most people want to see what they're buying, unless it's a repeat, you know, shopping list. Yeah, agreed. I mean, there there are things that I still have to go to a Target or a Safeway mm -hmm. or... I just psychologically, I just, I want to pick it up and take it home. It yeah. just, I don't know. It's maybe just because I'm an old person, but <laughs> there you go. Amazon, best of luck. Uh, <laughs> if you're an Apple fan, uh, you might be an Amazon fan as well, but Apple fans, we do see you, we hear you. And Eileen Rivera and I decided to make a podcast for you and all of us. Every week, we host Apple Vision Show. We talk about products, tips, all the news and lots more. Uh, in fact, we just published our 25th episode talking about the Olympics, uh, talking about what's going on, it, you know, the rumors about the new iPhone 16, lots of good stuff. AppleVisionShow.com is where you can find out more, and we'd love it if you join us. You'd be forgiven uh, for thinking that every startup is about AI these days, uh, especially because every startup tries to use the word AI <laughs> when, when they make their pitch. Uh, but there's an entire segment of the tech community focus on pet health. Uh, Kate has been following this area. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the innovations these companies are bringing to pet health. Yeah, I mean, the biggest couple of the biggest trends I'm seeing at the moment is diagnostics. 
because particularly for um, conditions that it's harder to um, detect. So we're able to do, at, for example, at-home diagnostics. Um, there's some really interesting stuff happening with PCR parasite screening um, with the VNNE's company. Um, there's a American company doing oncology screenings, like cancer screenings. Um, probably the one I've really got my eye on is, is called LampoVet. It's an Italian company. And they're focused on gut biome in pets, where you can integrate sort of um, at-home testing where, with, for microbiomes in the animals, and then it's um, the results are shared with a vet as a way to determine um, the ideal diet for a pet and whether there's any supplements needed. Probably the last one I'd mention in this area that's really, you know, I think this is the start of something we're going to see a lot more of. It's a company called uh, Sylvester AI, and they basically have an app where they're tracking pet health or cat health rather. The way they're doing it, they're actually looking at the face um, of oh. the um, animal. So they're looking at um, the facial expressions because we know that cats notoriously um, are programmed to hide pain. So how do you tell when a cat's in pain if it's not, you know, obviously limping? So they basically have a model looking at um, the expressions based on a, a pain scale from a vet, you know, veterinarian pain scale. And they say that's at an 85% precision. So that's pretty cool. So um, it's, it's like a computer vision thing where it's, it's mm. trained to, to check that out? Yeah, and it's something that, you know, this is a standalone company, but I know I'm already seeing companies here in Europe talking about in integrating this into something like a, a smart cat leader or something like that. So an mm -hmm. add-on to an additional product, maybe a subscription, some interesting stuff there. Um, probably one other one I'd mention in this area would be VetChip, which is actually an Australian company, and they're looking at a biosensor that you place under the skin, much like you would a, um, an ID chip for an animal. And that's where you get all those usual kind of Fitbit metrics that you would uh -huh. get with a, you know, a wearable collar or what have you. Super interesting. Yeah, a lot of these are at home for things that I would have to go to the vet for parasite yeah. analysis, at home cancer screening. Uh, yeah. The idea of not having to take the pet into the vet, I think, is incredibly appealing to, to exactly. most people because pets never think, like it. Yeah, but how, and this is how, kind of, how complicated is that to do yourself? Mm, it seems messy. This, this is a really good point. I mean, I think the tests are pretty easy to do. Most of them are kind of, you know, pee on a stick type stuff um, okay. at that, that kind of level. Um, however, the problem is integration. So, for uh -huh. example, you may be able to use the, um, the, the um, virtual pet center, for example, no problem. Um, and you could do your blood test, but then you might need to get medication, for example. Uh -huh. So, therefore, how do you get the medication? If the, the company is, in, on, for example, in Europe, maybe they're on the other side of Europe. Therefore, yeah. I'm going to have to go to a vet to get that. And I'm going to have, um, oh, I've got these tests online. Does this integrate with their ERP? Do they recognize the tests themselves? Because there's all this kind of proprietary stuff. And a lot of vet clinics are still that kind of old school, you know, yeah. old school software. And so try and, that'll be the biggest problem for a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah. And vets are very, very cautious of supporting any um, – any tech in general because of the risks, you know, they don't want to be seen as peddling any subscription products right. or, um, you know, new supplements or pet food, things like that. That's kind of a sticking point there. Yeah. So there, there's, there's always that with, this is true of any startup area, right? Mm, is getting absolutely. the trust and the acceptance and the, yeah. and the integration. Uh, what about support for the startups in general? How are they getting their funding? Yeah, there's a couple of really interesting programs that I recommend anyone to check out just for interest to see what's happening in the sector. Unleashed by Purina, which is obviously a pet food company. They have like an incubator or accelerator program for pet tech companies and they correspond with a, um, you know, lots of events, uh, regional events where startups can go into the program. They get a little bit of funding. They get to, you know, work with a big company with the idea that that could become a, a customer in the future. Similarly, Mars Pet Care, which is a subdivision of Mars, they have a VC investment ring now, which is really interesting. And they you know, invest in startups. They do conferences um, around Europe, uh, UK, I think, uh, US as well, of course. So a really good way of bringing that support in because they're basically looking for the next big products to, um, to acquire, I guess. That's Mars, the candy maker, Mars? Totally. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. so funny. Yeah. Don't it's give so a weird, Mars right? bar to your to your pet, though. That's well, funny. and yeah, I mean, M&M's, Snickers. I mean, Mars is 
they 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 got a that's lot a of stuff. massive company it's a behemoth yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um no, that, that, that's interesting. So do you know, like, what are the conditions of this? Does Purina or Mars get a stake? Is that how this works? Are there, are there partnerships? Or yeah, is this I just mean, grant money? Can, yeah. I mean, you can do the product. You can do the, the programs. There's no um, proof that they will become an investor in, in, a, in you know, in that real sense, you know, series, ser- you know, pre-seed, seed, series A, what have you. Um, but what it does is it introduces you to um, people in the industry, which is often the hardest thing. This is a very saturated industry for startups, particularly anyone doing your more kind of standard stuff like, say, pet food and trying to crack those markets is really difficult. Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to talk a little more on, on Good Day Internet about some of the cool. other things that you're finding, but but let's finish here with what do you see coming? What, what are some of the yeah. next pet tech innovations on the horizon? Yeah, just to, um, probably two or three big things. First one is elder care. Um, you know, people are having pets longer, of course, as in part of their life, and the need for more research into um, quality of life for animals as they age mm-hmm. um, and their needs in gerontology so forth. Um not to be on a downer, but um, yeah. pet euthanasia, end of life care, um, including things like disposal, particularly if you live in an apartment, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you might be having this great virtual vet, but you're, how do you get rid of your, your animal, right? Mm-hmm. If, if yeah. you, um, that's a, a fact of the matter. Um, likewise, we're going to see things like funerals, that kind of care um, support side of things. I think that's probably a little bit underestimated given that people are, you know, choosing pets over children in some respects. The mm. other one I would really push is personalised medicine. Um, an example is a really interesting Helsinki company called Curify, and they're making 3D, 3D printed um, tools to enable um, compound uh, pharmacy manufacturers to make uh, tablets, for example, in different shapes, different colours oh and flavours. <laughs> that and is a genius super, idea. I mean, obviously it's not limited to pets, let's be clear. Sure. But, I mean... It's, you know, you could imagine, like, for example, if, it, if you have a cat that's allergic to chicken, you can take chicken out of it or what uh-huh. have you. And so, and you can put it in a different shape for a smaller animal. With a oh, small or animal. you have a 13-year-old border collie that, that is too smart to take any pill that you give him. Uh, <laughs> totally. So you need to yeah. come up with different shapes and flavors and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Because we, we went yeah. through that with, with my border collars. Border Collie Sawyer, and we had to get compounded yeah. medicine, and we had to try to get special shapes, but there was a limit to what we could try, and this would, yeah, would make it almost limitless. That's amazing. And it's not cheap, let's yeah. be honest. You know. Yeah, sure. No, it's definitely Ooh. not. Well, uh, thank you so much, Kate. Uh, it, I, I know we're going to plug this at the end, but I, I you're following this space very, very closely, so where should people go to find more of what you're doing? Well, I mean, you can um, join us at TechEU. Um, we do all kinds of news. We cover everything, it seems, these days because we're, you know, the news is always moving and yeah, there's yeah. so much happening. Um, LinkedIn, obviously, Twitter. Excellent. Twitter, Twitter, Twitter X. We're going to repeat Thanks. that again just in a minute, but uh, first, let's check the mailbag. <laughs> Uh, so there is a discussion on the most recent twit, that's This Week in Tech, where Tom and I both used to work, that suggested the Southwest using Windows 3.1 story was a myth. This article supports that as well. This comes from Don, who uh, sends us the article, um, at which we will have in our show notes, um, with uh, a quote from December 30th of 2022 saying, some systems even look historic like they were designed on Windows 95. Yeah, so uh, he, he actually sent me a different link from a place I wasn't familiar with, but that links to this Dallas Morning News story that that Sarah mentioned. Uh, and the reason that I passed along the Southwest information earlier this week is that, you know, in, in the limited time we have, I usually go for trusted sources. And Digiday and Forbes are both medium trustworthy. They, they do a good job. Uh, you know, nobody's perfect and, and, and such. But I was like, well, if Forbes and Digiday are both saying it, chances are they did their research. And unfortunately, I should have clicked one more time because Digiday linked to this Dallas Morning News story uh, where they didn't even mention Windows 3.1. They just said that the old stuff Southwest used looked like Windows 95. Now, I saw enough of other people mentioning this, uh, people who are knowledgeable mentioning this, that I still suspect there might be something to the story. So, you know, if you work at Southwest Airlines and you can say yay or nay, I'll, I'll, keep, <laughs> I'll keep your identity secret, to, uh, but feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, anyway, uh, chances are uh, that it might not be true at all. Uh, and 
what I said earlier this week still holds. If it were true, uh, that means there are even more security vulnerabilities for Southwest Airlines running old operating systems like that. Uh, but hopefully it's not true. So there you go. Uh, and thank you, Don, for sending that along. Appreciate it. Indeed. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those emails that are always helpful to us. Kate Lawrence, you've been very, very helpful to us. Uh, <laughs> talk about links in our show notes. We're going to have all sorts of links to cool companies. You mentioned tech.eu where people can find you. You mm -hmm. also mentioned X, but you didn't mention your handle. So where can people find you there? Oh, at Kate underscore Lawrence would be it. Yep. Cool. Cool. Kate with a C. And Kate with Anything? a C. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I'm pretty easy to find. Excellent. Well, we're glad you found us. You can yes. find more of all three of us uh, if you're a patron because we have the extended show, Good Day Internet. We're going to talk more pet tech with Kate and probably a bunch of other things because it is Taco Tuesday. Stick around. You can catch our show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. And find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow talking about Bethesda employees unionizing with Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>